I get so excited coming here. Just driving in is like coming into another world. You leave the outside world behind, you come in that little drive and you come here and it's a great oasis, beautiful. Thornham Park is a bit of a hidden gem in a way. It's well known within Essex, but within the wider golfing world, it deserves much better attention because it is a fabulous layout and a very good example of Colt's work. My dad got me into golf when I was five, and I used to just go down the range with him. And then he got me a few clubs when I was about seven, I think. And it was all pink. I had a pink bag, pink grips, and I loved it. And I just wanted to play and play and play. I used to come up here before I played, actually, with my father. After a few times, I kind of thought, well, I quite like this. So he bought me some clubs. And in 1975, I think it was, I joined. And in the summer holidays, my mum used to drop me up here at 9.30 in the morning and spend all day up here. My beginning started with my dad, really. He took my brother and I down to the driving range when I was, I was about eight or nine years old. And the rest is history, really. <laughs> I mean, I got an enormous amount out of junior golf. And I don't like to blow my own trumpet, but when I was captain, I persuaded the committee to change the rule about only blood relatives joining this golf club. I play off two now. Uh, I started off 54 five years ago and just been gradually getting lower and lower. I try and practice every day, even if it's just doing like two hours of putting or chipping. The club professional, there's somebody called Reg Plumbridge, Reg was a very special professional. He taught a very good game of golf. He taught me how to chip, and particularly with the, the colt bunkers, how to chip over a colt bunker and stop the ball quickly. I can remember my father telling us stories about the old hall. They had a water pipe, I think it was about two inch diameter all the way round. It, this was 15 foot off the ground. And the more athletic members would try and see if they could get all the way around the room without falling down. Actually, Reg made my very first golf club, and it was a brassy. And I think we've still got it back at home somewhere. I have a very fond memory of it. Wood with a big B at the bottom with a little leather grip. There was Brian White, obviously the professional here. I think playing with Brian and he taught me how to conduct yourself on the golf course. There's another amateur golfer here who played in the Walker Cup called Jeff Godwin. And when I got to sort of the age of 17, 18 and started taking it quite seriously, playing in big amateur events, he sort of guided me what to play in and sort of gave me some insight. If you could play just one hole every day, what's your favourite hole and why? I'd say the third hole, definitely because the view of the lake off the tee is amazing. It's a really nice hole to a uh, birdie. And I try and aim just directly to the corner and then it just slowly draws around the corner, which is really good. It's quite daunting at first because it's such a big bit of water, but then after a while you realise that it's one of those holes that if you do go for it, you can have really good outcomes. My uncle, Gorby Gray has been connected with the golf club since it's basically his first inception in 1920. Um, he went in the pro shop six months after the club was formed and the Gray family has been here ever since. Gorby was the caddy master and eventually sorted out all the members with their games. Jimmy Gray, he, he caddied for me in a lot of events actually when I won the Essex Amateur a couple of times, the Chigwell Bowl twice. So yeah, he was by my side quite a lot. The old clubhouse was in the east wing of Thornton Hall. If you came in through the front door, there would be a passage in front of you and a staircase. Just keep going straight forward and you would come into what was the men's bar. Now, it has to be said that uh, when members arrived, particularly on a cold day like today, they might have their first drink before they went on to play, but basically you walk straight through the clubhouse, uh, through the men's bar, and then out the other side and onto the golf course. 
it was a somewhat ramshackle in, in, in many ways, the, the old clubhouse, although it had elements of grandeur. Uh, the men's changing room was uh, partly in what was the old library. We lived on this estate, the family, for about oh, 350 years. This building was commissioned by the ninth Lord Peter uh, in uh, the second half of the 18th century. Uh, he engaged an architect called Thomas Paine, who worked in the Palladian style, hence the appearance. The main block there you can see, and also the West Wing, were largely destroyed by fire at the end of the 19th century. Well, completely gutted, effectively. The East Wing survived, and that's where the family, my family, continued to live for another 30 or 40 years. Just after the First World War, a group of local businessmen were very keen to create a golf course for the growing town of Brentwood. I think quite a number of them were members of Romford Golf Club. First they looked at Childerditch, just a couple of miles away, and then, almost by chance, Thorndon Hall and Thorndon Park came on the market. I think they thought it was a beautiful parkland which could be turned into an excellent golf club. It was my great-grandfather, H.G. Beck, alongside my grandfather, Haverstock Bowman, who I think were the original architects in building the course and building the club all those years or so ago. When this club was formed, it was formed as a four-ball club, and I don't think there is a better game in golf than a friendly four-ball with your friends on a nice day on a decent golf course. H.G. Bank had five daughters, and it was my grandfather all those years ago who was billeted at the time of the First World War and fell in love with his eldest daughter. My grandfather, Harry Beck, who was a, an original founder member and subscribed to the original debenture, uh, 55 members put up £100 each. This is an old accounts book of my grandfather's, which I, I kept because it has some rather interesting bits of family history in it, but he religiously listed out his investments each year inked over 150, so I think there was a call for an extra 50 pounds pretty soon thereafter. That entry ap appears up until 1929, when it's doubled from 150 to 300 pounds, and it's two debentures, one for, for my grandfather, Harry Beck, who appears in the Mel of Cartoon. The other is labelled AHB, my, my father, Haverstock Bowman. So he'd obviously bought a debenture for my father as well. In those days, it was quite a fellowship, actually, of um, ex-warriors who formed the, the core of the club in, after the war into the 50s and certainly into the 60s. And I think these, these men had been away for many years fighting for their country and had suffered terribly as a result of it in seeing good friends of theirs being killed. And here they were able to enjoy competitive golf on a wonderful golf course, but equally they could support each other and they could talk in a way together that they wouldn't talk to third parties. Charles Newman, he was a great fun to play with, always full of stories, a delightful man, obviously an extremely brave man because of his VC. Well, he was a lieutenant colonel leading two commando in the uh, St. Nazaire raid um, and uh, where, they, where they were going to demolish the dry dock. Uh, and he had to keep the Germans at bay for long enough for the demolition team to lay the charges, which was successful. Um, and it was carnage for the commando. And Charles Newman led them. And eventually, they were exhausted of ammunition and captured. Um, but he was awarded the VC, which was an extraordinary accolade. And I think in some respects, he was awarded the VC in recognition of what two commando had done, because whilst he did survive, and it's unusual, actually, the VCs being awarded to those who survive, uh, two commando did suffer terrible casualty uh, doing what they did. Harold, my grandfather, was an early member. His reputation wasn't terrific. He had a reputation of having rather deep pockets and rather short arms because he was always last to the bar. Tony Huff had been captain of, of the club, uh, also president. In 42, he joined the SAS and he, on a deep penetration raid uh, near Misrata, 
uh, they got into a tremendous firefight and they were a long way behind enemy lines and with really no hope at all of ever getting out. And Sterling basically knew that. Um, and they were captured. And he went to a prisoner of war camp in Italy called Chieti on the Adriatic coast. In December 1943, he made his bid to escape through the snow of the mountains and um, managed to get across the, under the German guns by swimming a river at the Gustav line and then got across to the Allied lines in um, three or four days after Christmas 1943 near Cassidy. Harry Chaplin Colt was probably one of the, the best designers that, that, that there ever was. At the time when he created the course, there were avenues of great oaks. It, this was a parkland area. The Thorndon Paul property has, has been here since the Doomsday Book, but uh, the park was laid out more or less in its present form by the eighth Lord Peter. He imported trees by the thousand from the New World, uh, varieties which had never been seen in this country before. And it was a, a, a sort of um, uh, park built for leisure, if you like. It's nice soil here. Essex is on clay, and it's not, it's not the greatest place to build a golf course. But this has never been farmland. It was a deer park. And the, the soil here and the surfaces here are that little bit softer to walk on. It's not quite so solid as it is on other courses. And we have finer grasses here. The course as it is today very much follows the lines that Harry Colt laid out in, in 1919 and, and 1920. The difference is that there has been over the years an encroachment of smaller trees. These in the last couple of years have been weeded out but still leaving the bulk of the great oaks which Colt kept from uh, Capability Brown's uh, days. Harry Colt is one of my favourite golf architects. He's uh, as good as anyone that's ever lived and designed golf courses. He designed fabulous courses, in, including Wentworth, the West and East courses. And you can imagine the businessmen standing on the, the balcony at Thorndon Hall, gazing south towards this great parkland. You've got the fantastic Capability brown canvas, which Colt created this wonderful layout on. Um, such a variety of experience. Um, every hole is different, very memorable. He could see from the lake in front of what's now the third hole, was then called New Hall Pond. He could see that little valley, the stream which ran alongside uh, the, the third, and then across the fourth, just before the, the green at the fifth, through to the lake at the 15th. He loved using natural features. He did very little remodeling here. Well, this is a, a wonderful mid-length par four that Colt designed. You can see we're standing pretty well on the perfect landing zone, about 220 yards from the back tee. Uh, you've got to be a bit careful not to overrun the shot and end up in the water hazard. So from here, you've got about 160 yards to the green. And the key really is the diagonal bunkering on both the right-hand side, but also up the left-hand side. The sloping nature of the ground means you can bounce the ball into the green if you land short, but you've also got the option for a very good player that can play directly at the green. The fourth. I always, always, always bogey that hole. No matter how many times I try and not bogey it, I bogey it. Colt was always very good at layout design. He would really make the best features of the land, as he's done here with this fantastic capability brown landscape. Um, he was able to maximize the, you know, the high points for greens quite often. Uh, you get some very nice runoffs from greens. That was a, a real feature of his green complexes, that if you didn't quite find the right spot, you could easily run away and then have a very awkward shot back onto the green. The 15th is another of the par threes, like the fifth, that plays over a valley. Um, Colt really made the best use of the natural topography here, as you can see. And there's a, a pond that was created, dammed to, to create just in the foreground. Um, the nice thing here is you've got a bunker short of the green, 
which foreshortens the distance a little bit. It's about 15 yards short, but it looks like it's quite close to the putting surface. There was another bunker just behind that, immediately behind, but we moved it back closer to the green to be a bit more challenging for today's golfer with modern equipment. For Harry Colt, the mantra was, make it fair for all levels of golfers. I've played here for so many years and I never get bored with playing it. And I think for me, that means it must be something special. There's lots of different shaped holes. So you've got to move the ball left and right, right and left. And strategically, I think it's good. It's changed a bit. The tenth was played up between a, a path with brambles all the way up to the around about where the, the first bunk on the right is now. And behind the green was a mirror so that you could see whether people had finished playing or not. Back in the 1950s, mid-1950s, the lease for the land of all the course, the old building and the entrance up to the, the hall, all of it came up for sale. And they offered it to the club to buy. But the committee of the day discussed it and they decided that, no, they couldn't afford it, unfortunately. It was quite soon after the war, so money was very tight, obviously, then. And my father-in-law, Noel Barber, he was a banker. He, was, he ended up as man, chief general manager at the Midland Bank. And he said, look, we've got to buy it. So he got together with some other members, Lewis Bayman, who was well known in Brentwood area, Arnold Keeble, he was an insurance chap in London, and Harold Philpot. And Harold is a big a farmer in Essex, and his son Peter and Joanne are still members here. Well, they got together and they guaranteed the money to buy the lease. From 1920 for 50 years, it stayed in the chapel with other rooms attached. In some of the corners, there were great big mushrooms going out of the wall. And every now and then, people would come and knock them down and then paint over it. But they'd grow again because it was damp. Equally, I don't think we could have grown in the old clubhouse. I mean, the ladies' section was pretty primitive. The men's changing room was even more primitive. Uh, so even if we'd stayed, we'd have had to spend a lot of money bringing it up to modern standards. So it was decided to build over here. Gee, we need a new clubhouse. Health and safety wasn't involved then, and we had these 35 rickety stairs to come down, and you were lucky if you got to the first tee without having a sprained ankle. If you look at the building here, on the far right-hand side, there was a door. It's now a window. But you had to come down these steps, all down these steps from about the third floor up, which was quite steep. I think there were 36 steps, something like that, down to the ground, and that's how you had to come in and go out to your changing room. So they couldn't walk through the, the, the bars in their nailed shoes, so they had to have a staircase down from the outside. That was why it was there, to enable them to get from their changing room wearing their golfing shoes. It was overwhelmingly passed by the membership that we should go into a, a new building. There was a member here called Alfie Bates. Alfie Bates had this view of wanting to restore Thorndon Hall to its former glory. And so we were able to sell it to him, and with the money we were able to build a new clubhouse. Going back a long way, the change from the old clubhouse to this clubhouse was, was a massive change, because I think something was lost at that time, actually. I know the old clubhouse was in pretty dreadful condition and you, you couldn't possibly stay there, but I think something of the spirit of the late 40s and 50s was lost, possibly for the right reasons. And I think more recently, the way this club has developed and opened up a bit and, and it's more egalitarian and it's a much sort of, it's a, it's a social club and in that sense, it's probably better than it might have been. An amazing story, really. We moved up from the hall to here in about 74, 75. There is behind us the men only bar. It isn't now, it was then. And uh, there was this lovely patio here. And there are many stories, but the one I heard was that um, there was a gentleman who didn't go home for his Sunday lunch on time very often. One Sunday, the wife stomped up across the, putting, uh, the patio here, 
plonked his dinner in front of him and said, if you're not coming to your dinner, here's your dinner, and stomped off again. And I don't think the men liked all this stomping. So the next thing we know, this has now become an extension of the men's bar and ladies are not allowed on here. So that was a bit tricky because there was nowhere for us. We had to sit down there a little bit lower. But eventually the, um, they made some concessions. The hatch was put in and we were allowed to walk across here uh, to the hatch to get a drink. I was captain 2004-05 at a time when the captain was still the chief executive of the business. I had the temerity of actually getting my committee to agree that we should convert this bar from a men's bar into a member's bar because the ladies weren't allowed in here and there were sort of quite a few members, well, a number of members who wanted to impeach me uh, for, for doing this, but it, it, we got it through with us and, uh, you know, look at it today. Four years ago, I turned 50, so um, I played uh, on the European Senior Tour and I happened to win the Scottish Open, which was pleasing. It's given me a, a bit of a new lease of life to sort of keep playing again. See, the big dream, like the big, big dream that I have to come really good is there's a, like the PGA and all of that and becoming a professional and like getting into the big competitions like the Masters and Ryder Cup. To win the Women's British Open, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I hate the game of golf, <laughs> um, but I love Thornham Park. I think it's the most infuriating of all the sports I've ever played, and that's what keeps us all coming back on it. Just for those occasions where it comes right out the middle of the club, and you think, God, you know, isn't that marvellous? I won this morning. One shot this morning I hit, and I thought, God, that was good. But the biggest asset of this club, other than the course, is the staff. And we've we realised that, and we've been very lucky with the staff that we've had over the years in terms of greenkeepers, stewards, professionals, um, secretaries. Um, you know, going back, I, I, I remember Lionel Platts as a, as a professional. I remember Walter the barman who ran the place with a rod of iron. He was everything you, you could want as a barber. My most memorable moment, I suppose, is 29th of August 1970. Played well in the morning, got married in the afternoon. <laughs> I used to love playing with my father-in-law in the mixed foursomes and things. That was always good fun. And of course meeting David, my husband here, was nice. And we used to play in the Jackson Cup, the mixed foursomes, which we won a few times. Walking around this place whether you're playing well or badly is an honour. You don't see thousands of people out there while you're playing. You could be on your own. You really could. It's millionaire's golf so much of the time. There is nothing better than sitting out on the patio in the summer with your friends uh, after a round of golf and just enjoying the company of the people that you've played with. Here's to our centenary. Here's to the future. Here's, Here's to our team. team. Cheers. Cheers.